All right, this is the last section of the muscle origin insertion action. I'm just going to go over some principles of muscle action based on muscle location around a joint. All right, so here's a couple examples right here, right? Flexing at the neck at the at low occipital joint right here. So here are these, your sternocleidomastoid. Occasionally, the names will reflect their origins and insertions. So remember we said down here, here's your sternum, here's your cleto or clavicle and this is the origin up here they're moving up to the mastoid process so your sternocleidomastoid muscle when it contracts it's going to flex your neck right it's going to bring your head toward the front of your body right there here is your anterior delts from your clavicle over onto your humerus right here this is when it contracts it's going to call this flexion of the shoulder right there and if you want to flex your shoulder and the elbow, your biceps brachii can do either right? because it's spanning two joints right here, it's spanning your shoulder and your elbow joint, and it's spanning the anterior surface, in fact. And your, all your wrist, wrist flexors and digit flexors right here are on the anterior surface of your arm, spanning the wrist joint going out here. So here's all your wrist flexors and digit flexors, and here's your elbow flexors. So those are pretty obvious. Flexion of the hip is a little more complicated or misunderstood, right? So when you're making this movement right here, when your legs are grounded, there's their link to the ground, and your whole trunk, upper trunk moves down, decreases this angle to 90 degrees, this is called flexion at the hip right here, right? This is also called flexion of the hip, right? So now one of your legs is unlinked, but you see it's causing the same angle difference. You're doing the same movement. It's whether your legs are linked or not to the ground, right? You could imagine if he was standing on some dip bars or something, he could move both these legs up. That would be flexion at the hip, right? It's your thighs moving in your hip joint right there. Your back can be completely straight. So those muscles, that are doing your hip flexion, right? They're starting on the femur down here and then moving up toward the psoas major. This is one of those tricky origins and insertions because depending on whether your feet are grounded or not, it's not clear what's moving or not, right? But your psoas major right, is a major hip flexor right here. So over here too, you got your abs. Right? Let's look at those for a second. So just, I'll go back to that in a second. All these movements, notice you want to look at the relationship between your back right, and your femur right here, right? The angle between them is all about the same. So these are all pretty much equal for flexion of the hip. This movement right here, when your back is curved, your actual thoracic spine is curved, is not flexion of the hip. This is considered vertebral flexion. This one is done by your abdominal, abdominal wall muscles, right? So you can see how this is very different from this. This is good when you're lifting heavy things. This is bad unless you're doing upside down cat or whatever the yoga movement is, right? So vertebral flexion is a different movement than flexion. All right, so here's your hairs over here. The attachments of your rectus abdominis in this case, right? They're going from your rib cage down over here to around your pubic symphysis. So when they contract, they're going to move your whole vertebrae uh, spine and bend it over like that. And so here are some of your obliques, right? Uh, I mean, your, your abdominal muscles, you have your rectus abdominis moving this way. You have your external obliques over here, your obliques, your transverse abdominis right here. All these are flexors of the spine. So the other thing about those, when you look at the, this was my point here. When you look at the of those, you'll see, you know, flex vertebral column right there, as well as the lateral flexion. If you contract just these muscles right here, you'll have a lateral flexion over here. That's what that means right there. But the other action they're doing over here is basically holding all your guts in right there. They're basically your rib, you know, all your upper organs are attached, are protected by your rib cage, 
right? But these lower organs down here don't have any bony protection until you get to your hip bone. So all these, all those abdominal muscles are also kind of holding in your guts right there, right? So that's an important uh, function of these. Right? That's where those come in. So flexion on the spine, flexion at the hip, right? So another way to think of it when you're doing crunches, if you know this movement right here versus sit-ups right there, bending your spine or not, right? All right, here's another muscle that's doing flexion of the hip right here. Your rectus femoris, this is spanning, your, it originates up on your anterior, inferior, superior iliac spine up here, up on the hip, spans the hip joint, and attaches down into the patella, into the quadriceps tendon right there. If you contract that and your foot's not fully grounded, it'll move up, right? It'll flex your hip right there. So it's your rectus femoris. So what we may have noticed in all this, or not, is the position of all these muscles when we're talking about flexion right here, when we're talking about these flexion movements. So here's a cartoon right here of this person. They're making certain flexion tension movements. In green right here, here's your sternocleidomastoid. Here's, say, your anterior delts. Here's your brachialis muscle. Here is, well, that would be your vertebral spine flexion over here. Here is your, let's just say, rectus femoris. Here's one of those wrist flexors right here. These are all on the anterior surface, right? This spanning the anterior surface of this joint, this joint, this joint, this joint, this joint. What's the trend here? All your flexors up here are on the anterior surface of that joint. So if you know the origin and insertion of a muscle, that is, if you can identify it, what Side of the joint it spans, you know it's action, right? As long as you know what that action is. So that's your first basic principle so that instead of memorizing each individual action, try to do it on principle. So now you learn that all those muscles are spanning the anterior surface of your joint for flexors. And you're like, good, that's easy. Except that everything turns backwards when you get to the knee and ankle joints, right? Because you're going, this movement is bringing these limbs in an anterior position for flexion. This contraction is going to be moving it in a, the flexion movement is going to be moving in a posterior plane. So all the muscles on the posterior surface of the joint, this goes for your knee and your ankle, right? So your major knee flexors like your hamstrings and your major ankle flexors are known as plantar flexion are to be on the posterior surface. Okay. So the flex down here. What do you think? Where do you think all your extensors are? I know you're all thinking it. They're all on the back, right? They're spanning this posterior surface of that joint. When they contract, they're usually bringing the movement back to anatomical position or in the posterior plane. That's right, so all your extensor muscles on your upper body right here are going to be on the posterior surface. So if you knew your biceps is on the front part, your triceps are on the back, you know half the battle right there. You just got to know flexors and extensors right there, what that movement is and what joint it spans. And then the same goes true below the knee, all your knee and ankle extensors and this is called dorsiflexion are going to be on the anterior surface. So your quads right here are spanning the anterior surface of your knee, they're extend knee extensors. This is a big principle and you got to really, if you have that down, you've, that's a bit, it goes a long way in understanding and not having to memorize. Once you've learned roughly the position of that muscle around the joint, then you're going to know what its action is at that joint. Okay, so muscles crossing the anterior side, producing flexion. And big major exception is that once you get to the knee and ankle, it's gonna switch around just based on that flexion movement of your knee is bringing, is bringing your bottom, your leg basically closer to your body. That's a flexion movement. Right, so here's that 
flexion at the knee, around the knee joint right here, all those muscles, your hamstrings, your soleus, and then flexion at the ankle are gonna be around the posterior part, right? So muscle that crosses the posterior side producing extension for your upper body. And then again, doesn't apply to the knee and ankle. All right, so the same principle, that is the muscle spanning a particular side of the joint, and this really goes for our limbs, our shoulder and hip joints, uh, as well as our wrist. Right, they're gonna be spanning, the muscles that are spanning the lateral side is gonna produce abduction, right? It makes sense. Your, your delts are spanning the lateral side. When they contract, they're gonna move your whole arm outward, right? So, and then down on the wrist, down on your wrist area, you have, well, this gets a little more complicated. I'll talk about that, but because these are both spanning your flexor and extensor carpi radialis are on the lateral side of your wrists, then they're both wrist abductors. And the same obvious, opposite is true. If they're spanning the medial side, it's gonna bring that limb, that bone back toward the body. With that in mind, right, you're gonna to have to learn all these. You wanna save a lot of memory room, you can kind of look at the general location and get partial points, right? Uh, for those answers that you put on the practical, right? And then for this, all you gotta know, what surface of the joint is it spanning? Is it spanning the anterior? Is it spanning the posterior? Is it spanning the medial? Is it spanning the lateral? For your knee and elbow joint, it's only flexion and extension. For your shoulders, your hips, and your wrists, basically, it's gonna be those abduction and adduction as well. So as you study the particular muscle, you'll see where it starts or rather originates and where it inserts. And so you can determine not only what joint does it cover, but more importantly, which side of the joint does it cover. And from there, you're going to usually able to guess what the movement of that muscle does upon contraction. So your origins, insertion, actions should all be learned together as you're learning the muscle because all that information is integrated. All right, see you next time.